Welcome everyone to another episode of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. I'm your host, Javon Harrington. Back to hit you another video, and today we're going to be getting into the next series added to the Power Core Productions franchise line, and that is going to be What If Tondro Had Venom, Demon Slayer Dark Fury. Now, for those of you who might be aware, I did have this series up on the channel, like many others, a couple of months ago before I did a little bit of a cleansing, if you will, simply because at the time I didn't think that there was enough attention given to the series as a whole and I didn't think that many of you guys would be interested in it but recently after I've done some more polls seeing what series you guys would like a lot of you were asking to bring the series back and I personally did like it and I like the structure so I've decided that we're going to reboot and relaunch this series here on Power Core Productions. Now for this this series is going to be a bit different than most Simply because Demon Slayer, I would say among many anime, is probably the most structured that I've ever come across. So for this portion in particular for season one, you can actually divide season one into six arcs in particular. And you can divide those arcs via episodes. So for these videos in particular, some videos might be longer than others because I am going to go literally arc for arc. So in this part, part one, we're going to cover the first arc, the final selection arc, which is the first five episodes. So that's where I'm taking my reference from. Whereas when we get into part two, which is only two episodes, that part is probably going to be rather short, probably going to be one of my shortest videos. So that's just something to keep in mind. Yes, I am going to cover the Mugen Train movie. That's going to be a part of the series as well. And this is just going to get a little bit into preparation as we get into season two of Demon Slayer that's going to be coming out this December. So I do hope you will enjoy this series as well as everything else that's going to be coming out with Power Core Productions and Podcastings as we are on the road to 2K and beyond. But as always, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings. And now, without further ado, let's get into today's video. So as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Far off in space, in an unknown part of the universe, there lied a planet, a planet known only as Klintar. This planet laid host to the symbiotes, a race of alien-like parasitic beings who bonded with various and different hosts in order to survive. As the planet awaited its destruction, many of the symbiotes would take off into space in order to find new homes. One in particular, under the name of Venom, would find itself setting a course for the planet known as Earth. However, this Earth was not like the one of which he would be familiar with, and this would start a new adventure. As Venom would land onto Earth, he would find himself crashing into a cold-like mountainside. As the symbiote would slowly crawl from out of its cocoon, it would start to shiver and freeze, realizing that it needed to find a host and quickly. As the temperatures would begin to drop as nightfall would fall over the area, it was obvious that if it did not find a host soon, it would freeze itself to death. In the meantime, a young boy known as Tanjiro Kamamado had been returning from the town down below back to his home. He had a rather large family with his mother as well as his older and younger siblings, and he served to be their provider in many ways, being the one who would go out to sell the coal down into town square, as well as helping the villagers in any way that they might need as he was known for having a keen sense of smell. As he was making his way back up the mountain to return home, it would start to become nightfall rather quickly as another batch of snow would begin to fall down over the area. As he was making his way, he would be stopped by one of the neighbors from the lower side of the mountain. This neighbor wanting to bring Tondro in to stay the night, warning that it would be better off for him to do so and to avoid running into a potential demon in the forest. 
the demons, enemies of mankind, unknown creatures of destructive capabilities who fed on the blood and the flesh of humans. While Tandro would try to persist, old man Saburo would insist on Tandro staying the night. Ultimately, Tandro would cave in and do as he was told. However, he would make it very clear that he would be setting out first thing in the morning to get back home. However, unknown to Tandro that morning as he had left his household, it would be the last time that he would see his family alive. As Tandro slept in Old Man Sabra's home, the symbiote would slowly make its way into the household, slipping through the cracks as it trudged itself across the floor slowly. It was in desperate need of a host, anyone would do at that moment. As it came across the room where Tandra was sleeping, it would slowly make its way over to his body, as the ooze would begin to fall and cover him completely. At the last moment, Tandra would wake up. However, as quickly as he did, he would fall back unconscious. Unknowingly, that the symbiote had bonded to him and to his body. The next morning, Tandro would awaken, putting his clothes back on as he would immediately head out, wanting to be with his family as soon as possible. However, as he trudged up the mountain, he would start to get an eerie feeling. The smell of blood would begin to fill into the air. A sense of worry and dread would wash over him as he made his way closer to his home only to find that it had completely ransacked and destroyed. And across the snow-covered ground, the fresh white soaked in the blood of his family members. Tandra would be horrified and sickened at what he saw. He would see the bodies of his mother, his younger siblings, all of them dead. Tandra would fall to his knees, completely devastated at what he had come across. However, walking amongst his deceased siblings, he would come across his younger sister, Nezuko. As he checked on her faintly, he could see that she was still alive. He would put her on his back as he would run through the snow-covered forest, desperately trying to seek help. Nezuko would slowly start to groan and move, Tandro assuring her that everything would be fine. However, before he had a chance to do anything, Nezuko would kick him in the back, sending him to the ground as he would turn to see his sister. Her canines now enlarged, her mouth salivating as if she were starving, her eyes now emboldened, and her fingernails now grown in the claws. Tandro did not want to believe what was happening, but now there could be no mistaking it at this moment. His sister had somehow been turned into a demon. As Nezuko would lunge at Tanjiro, Tanjiro would reach out his arms to try to get her to stop. However, as he did so, his arms would change in a way that he couldn't even fathom. His arms had turned completely black and had gotten slightly bigger, and they had claws of their own. Holding back Nezuko, he tried to figure out what was happening. Had he become a demon somehow? He couldn't remember, he knows he wasn't attacked and he wasn't scarred, but how was he doing this? It would be at that moment that he would hear a voice in the back of his head. Do not be mistaken, it is not because of you that you do these things, but it is me. Tandro would now sense the presence within him, he wouldn't know what this being was. He would stammer in his words trying to figure it out, however the voice in his head would simply tell him to shut up and that he had to be focused on keeping his host alive. However, as Venom would try to struggle with Tandro for control of his body and fighting off Nezuko, Tandro would also be struggling with the fight within himself. Venom could sense the boy's strong will, not thinking that it could be strong enough to even overpower him. However, Venom had been in a weakened state for a while now, and he wasn't at full strength. As this three-way battle for control went on, a Demon Slayer, 
one known as Giyu Tomika, had come across the situation. He had not gone too far from where the home had been attacked, realizing that he had arrived a day too late. As he looked over, he would see Tondro doing battle with Nezuko. Tondro's body slowly being enveloped in the symbiote, and now a more monstrous side starting to be revealed. Giyu would draw his sword, not sure of what to do at this moment. From what he could see, there were two monsters, and it seemed like they were fighting each other. He would attempt to slice at Nezuko, but before he could, Tondro, now gaining some control, would shoot out a tendril that would swipe away at Giyu, forcing him back into retreat. Tondro would yell out to him to not harm his sister. This would leave Giyu in an even more state of confusion as he had no idea just what was going on here. From what he could gather and what he could sense, Tandro was not a demon. Whatever or whatever this being was that was a part of him, it wasn't demon at all. Tandro was still completely human, but he still lacked control. As for Nezuko, he could tell without a shadow of a doubt that she was in fact demon and it was his job to slay her. However, before he could even get close, Tandro would get in between them once again, stopping him from getting any closer. Gi would argue with Tandro, telling him that he didn't know just who or what he was, but in either case, he couldn't just turn a blind eye to the situation. Tandro would try desperately to explain what was going on, even though he couldn't fully either as his body would be completely taken over. He would now be in a bulky like Venom form. Tandro would yell through Venom's voice to stay away from her. Giyu, now seeing this he would have to slay them both. He would prepare himself as he went to charge. Tandro, now encased in Venom, would lunge at him as well, as the two would begin to fight with one another. Tandro, however, was clunky and inexperienced in battle, giving Giyu the advantage, until eventually Giyu was able to see an opening and hit him just hard enough to knock him to the ground, as the Venom symbiote would be in and out of a frenzy-like state. He would make his way over to Nezuko. However, Nezuko would kick Giyu away, standing in front of Tandro in Venom, in a defensive stance ready to protect. Giyu could make out from this that Nezuko had not harmed any humans, and that even though she were fighting her own hungers, she was still willing to protect a human. Giyu would put his sword away, but he would still keep his hand on the hilt at the ready. He would yell out to Tandro to explain what was going on. Tandro would still not fully understand what was happening himself. However, he would try to speak to the entity within him to ask what was going on. Venom would then retreat back into Tanjiro's body. However, a dark-like sludge would appear from Tanjiro's shoulder. A being with big white eyes and with gnarling teeth. It would lunge at the two of them, yelling for them to stop and that he could explain what was going on. Giyu would walk closer but still be on guard. Tandro ready to listen as well. Nezuko would be knocked down on the ground. Venom would explain that he was not from this world, that he came from a planet far out in space, and that when he had arrived, the cold temperature almost destroyed him. Stating that he needed a host, he had found Tandro by chance and it latched onto him, and now this would be his only way to survive. Giyu would find this hard to believe, however, it wouldn't be too far-fetched. After all, he was a demon slayer, so anything was possible in the grand scheme of things. He would ask if Venom had any associates if he were a demon in any way himself. Venom would explain that he was nothing like the creature before him, referring to Nezuko, stating that he merely bonded with Tandro to survive. This now left Giyu with many things to ponder. Could he actually let them live in this case? Would it be the right thing? 
His job was to slay demons, yes, but Nezuko had not killed a human. And also, there was the matter of Tanjiro and whatever this venom was. From what he could deal out from how they fought, Venom definitely had the power to go toe to toe with demons. This could be an asset that the Demon Slayer Corps needed. Unknown to the world, the Demon Slayer Corps was not connected to any government. In fact, they worked from the shadows to protect humanity from the threat of the demon. However, centuries of battle had taken its toll on both sides. And as such, the demon were starting to outnumber the demon slayer in more ways than one. It was only going to be but a matter of time until eventually the tide of battle would turn in favor of the demon. It was just simply known that no matter how strong a demon slayer was, they were still only human. Fighting an uphill battle. However, now, seeing what power Venom had, if Tandro could learn how to harness his power, if he could learn how to master it somehow, this could give them the edge that they needed in combat. Giyu would look to Tandro and he would ask him what his resolve was. What exactly did he plan to do? Tandro explained that he would do anything that it took to save his sister's life and that he promised he would turn her back into a human. With that, Giyu would look to Tanjiro, and he would tell him to meet with a man at Mount Saguri. The man would be known as Sakunji Ur Kodaki. That was his master. If he truly wanted to stick to his resolve and to truly save his sister, then he must go there and learn in the ways of the sword. He would also warn to keep Nezuko away from sunlight as that was harmful to demons. However, because it was cloudy out, it was protecting her for the moment. He would also warn to keep that being under control, and that that being would be treated as the same way as Nezuko. If either of them harmed a human, then no matter what he said, he would have no choice but to put all of them down by any means necessary. Venom would be a bit annoyed at this, however all the same, as long as he didn't have to cross swords with any of them that would be fine. Although Venom would make it very clear that he needed to eat something to keep up his sustenance. And of course, there was no telling what a symbiote might do if its hunger was pushed to the limit. This would worry Tanjiro as Venom basically sounded like he suffered from the same affliction as his sister. However, as they were debating on what they should do in that moment, a flock of ducks would be flying over. Venom, who was desperately hungry, would send out his tendrils that would wrap around and grab the ducks, pulling them in as he started to eat them. Not too long after, he would cough up some feathers and lick his lips, stating that those ducks were rather delicious. Of course, Tandro didn't mind duck, in fact, it was something that he didn't mind eating at all. Although, he didn't like the idea of how Venom savagely scarfed them all down. Although, he would explain that this area in particular was known for having flocks of wild ducks all the time. Almost more than what they knew what to do with. If that could be a way of subsiding and keeping him from eating humans, then all the better. Venom would agree to this but he would make sure that he would get his fill of duck any time he got the chance. From there, Tanjiro would pick up his sister as they would make their way to Mount Saguri. Stopping by, they would pick up a broken basket from a rice farmer. Tanjiro would weave it and eventually get it made just enough so that Nezuko could be kept inside and kept her shield from the sun. He would ask if Venom could cover the basket in any way and keep the sunlight out with extra protection and Venom would agree to this, encasing the basket in symbiote, keeping it away from the others so that now Nezuko would have a dark place to sleep and would not have to worry about the sunlight. 
As they continued and made their way to Mount Siguri, Tondro and Venom would speak to one another. Tondro would surprisingly be fascinated with Venom asking where he had come from, about his planet and about the other symbiotes. As they spoke though, the conversation would take a dark turn, as Tondro would ask what would he have done if he needed to bond and had bonded with a demon instead. Venom would explain that that was simply what he would have done. Symbiotes usually take on the personalities and traits of their hosts to an extent. Because he had now bonded with Tanjiro, more or less he would take on his personality. Although not completely, as Venom made it very clear that he couldn't stand Tanjiro in his crying all the time, and if he did so, he had no problem shutting his mouth. Tanjiro wasn't really too fond of this, but all the same, he would agree. Eventually, nighttime would fall over them. As Nezuko would be let out of the basket to walk, Tanjiro would get the smell of blood as they would make their way over to a temple. Once arriving inside, they would come face to face with a demon who would be eating an elderly couple. Nezuko would be salivating as her bamboo-like gag was used to keep her mouth shut from potentially attacking anyone. As the demon looked at the two, it would be perplexed, but not for the reason you would think. Unknown to Tanjiro, Venom had given him a special ability that he wasn't fully aware of. It was a way of masking his human smell, as long as Venom and Tandro were attached to one another, to the demons. Tandro didn't have a smell. He didn't smell like a human, but he didn't smell like a demon either. It was basically a neutral smell, or in a way, if a demon didn't see Tandro, it would be as if he wasn't there at all. Tandro picked up on this as the demon didn't seem ready to lunge at either of them, instead mistaking them for rogue demons and asking what they were doing there. Tandro would try to ask if any information on how to turn a demon back into a human. However, the stray demon would simply attack at the two of them, Nezuko and Tandro both fending it off. Tandro attempted to fight the demon off on his own. However, at his own strength, he simply wasn't strong enough and he seemed to be hesitating rather much, eventually forcing Venom to get involved as he would cover Tondro completely in symbiote. Now taking his Venom form, he would thrash at the demon before slamming it into the tree, ultimately ripping its head off of its shoulders. However, the body would still be able to move, ultimately forcing Venom to have to rip it to shreds, before eventually they would pin the head to a tree, Tandro desperately trying to stop Venom as he needed to ask information from it. Tandro would try to ask the demon if there were any way to turn a demon back into a human, but once again the demon would remain silent. As he wasn't sure of what to do, Venom would go in for the kill, but Tandro would hold him back as he wasn't sure if this was the right thing. As they were fighting over with one another as to what to do with the body, eventually a man in a red mask would appear. He would tell Tanjiro that he were foolish for being as hesitant as he was, and that if it wasn't for his friend there, then he would have died a long time ago. The sun would begin to rise and the demon's body, all of its parts, would begin to turn into ash, giving them a first look at just how deadly the sunlight truly was. Seeing that Venom did not vaporize in the sunlight, it was now made clear that he was in fact not a demon, although to say that he were an ally to humans would be a bit of an understatement. As Venom would retreat itself back into Tandro's body, the old man would walk up to him and slap him in the face, telling him that if he continued to hesitate and not strengthen his resolve, then he was going to die in battle and that he would merely only be using Venom as a crutch, which would make him an inefficient partner. Upon realizing that this was the man that he was looking for, Tandro would bow and ask him to teach him the way of the sword, to give him a chance to save his sister's life. They would go and bury those who had been left inside of the temple, 
before arriving to get Nezuko, who was hiding away from the sun, as she went back into her basket before eventually arriving over to where Uradokai's house was. After doing so, they would then make their way up the mountain, Tandro following the old man. Once they made their way to the top, Tandro could feel that the air had become thin due to the altitude, and that his breathing was a lot harder than before. The old man would turn back to Tandro, and he would explain that he had been watching him carefully, and from what he could see, he needed to whip out those bad habits of his. Tandro would ask just what he meant by bad habits, and Sakanji would explain that if he developed the habit of depending on Venom way too much, then he was never going to get strong on his own. He would always be using Venom as a crutch, and what would happen if Venom wasn't able to save him? He had to be able to be his own man and stand on his own two feet. That was why during his training, Venom would be expressly forbidden from helping Tandro in any way. Venom was fine with this, as long as he got to eat as much duck as he wanted, and thankfully there were wild ducks all over the mountain. Tandro would ask what he meant by being weak, and he would explain that he had to be able to be strong on his own, to strengthen his own body. Seeing how their powers worked, Venom needed a host to stay alive, and in doing so he could amplify the host's power. The problem was that Tandro was far too weak. Sure, Venom could give Tandro superhuman strength and abilities, but in the end it would simply be a waste of his talents. Imagining, for example, if he had Venom, he would probably be far more stronger, and it would be a lot more use of his skills as they could adapt to one another. In the end, Venom was bringing everything to the table, and Tandro was lacking, basically just going along for the free ride. Now realizing just where he had been mistaken, he would explain that he would watch after Nezuko in the meantime, but he would have to keep his strength and resolve, knowing that if Venom or Nezuko ever killed a human, then that would be punishable by death for Tandro. Venom would object to this, stating that he wouldn't go as far as to kill a human if he didn't have to. However, Sankoji would make it very clear that there would be no exceptions. Then Venom would ask another question. What would happen if Nezuko killed a human and he did not? If Tandro had to die, then he was okay with that, but he needed a host. That was when Sankoji would explain that if Nezuko killed a human, then Venom would have to take over Tandro's body and would have to kill Nezuko himself, take Tandro to the home of the Hashira. From there, the Hashira would assign Venom a new host and Tandro would be executed. However, Tandro had to strengthen his resolve and become strong enough so that that fate never happened. With determination on his face, Tandro would agree to this, and as such, he would begin his training. Tandro's training would consist first of getting down the mountain, avoiding the booby traps, and doing so without the help of Venom. With his sense of smell, he thought that it would be a breeze at first, before realizing that it would be much more difficult than he had given him credit for, and dangerous. However, through hard work, he would eventually be able to get down the mountain. And from there, his training would be taken to the next level. Over the next two years, Tandro would focus on controlling his breathing, which was the main reason for the mountain exercise in the first place, as he had to control his breathing while going up the mountain's altitude and the air becoming thinner and thinner. The better he controlled his breathing, the better his sword techniques would be, including in learning the ways of the waterfall immersion and the total concentration. In doing so, he would come to learn of the ten water immersion forms. The first form, 
wire surface slash. The second form, wire wheel. The third form, flowing dance. The fourth form, striking tide. The fifth form, blessed rain after the drought. The sixth form, whirlpool. Seventh form, piercing raindrop. Eighth form, waterfall basin. Ninth form, splashing wire flow. And the tenth form, constant flux. As Tanjiro threw himself into his training, Venom would also take a liking to Tanjiro's fighting style and adopting it into his own ways. The first and foremost would be was that they had to find a way in order to combine their powers. During the day, Tanjiro would focus solely on his sword training as well as his breathing. This is where Venom would not help him. It would be at night where they would focus on the next stage of his training. First was creating a form with the symbiote that allowed Tandro to get the full use of his techniques. While he could use the bulky Venom form, in the end it was a lot more clunky and didn't provide much in terms of speed. This is where he came up with the idea to make the form more slender. Underneath Tandro's clothes, the symbiote would basically attach itself to Tandro's skin, forming a much more sleeker version of the symbiote suit. For reference, think of Tandro as wearing the black Spider-Man suit under his regular clothing. That basically would be how the symbiote would work. Also when doing so, Venom would take note of the sword forms, and in doing so, would come up with a few of his own. He would come up with five in particular, and he would be proud of himself in calling it Venom Breathing. Venom Breathing first form, Black Spike Trap. In this form, Venom would cover the Nichirin's sword in symbiote, and Tandro would stick the sword into the ground. From there, Venom would funnel symbiote through the sword under the ground, and in doing so, Black Spikes would shoot up at high altitudes and speeds, shooting out from all directions, a move that could be capable of taking out multiple enemies if surrounded. Venom Breathing Second Form Long Sword In this version, Venom would cover the sword in symbiote, increasing the length of the sword, allowing it to reach targets from a larger, longer distance, as well as having a larger sword in the swiping motion. This will also give the sword the ability to bend, the blade being able to move and curve around objects, moving almost like a whip. This would allow to reach up to 20 feet at any given moment from any given direction. Venom Breathing, Third Form, Frenzy Strike. This form focused more on doing flips and acrobatic moves keeping the opponent off guard and keeping a constant steady flow in movement. If you need a visual, think of Yoda's fighting style from Star Wars Form 4, Makashi. This would be an acrobatic fighting style which focused on attacking an opponent from multiple directions until a blind spot would be opened. The critical juncture of this attack focuses on maintaining movement and striking from every direction never giving your opponent in a chance to sell or a chance to gather themselves. However, the drawback is that if Tandro were to stop moving for more than 3 seconds, then he would lose flow, causing the cycle to be broken and he would have to start the process over again. This fighting style requires that Tandro keep movement at all times, never stopping even once. A key and crucial aspect to his breathing concentration as by having good and excellent breathing, he can maintain this frenzy mode for a long period of time. Venom Breathing, Fourth Form, Buzzsaw Shield In this form, Tanjiro would twirl his sword around his body at blinding speeds. With the increased strength that he would get from Venom in the symbiote, it would allow him to move the sword around his body at a nearly high speed until it appears as though Tandro is swinging multiple swords, when in reality it's just one, but it's moving so fast that it gives the illusion of multiple swords all at once. 
The buzzsaw shield is a defensive and offensive technique, as when doing so, it makes it hard for an opponent to get close to Tanjiro, for the closer they get, they suffer being ripped to shreds by the sword like a buzzsaw. This technique is good for fending off multiple opponents as well as blocking multiple projectiles. The fifth and final form, Venom Breathing Fifth Form Double Critical. This form requires that Venom fills Tandro's lungs entirely with symbiote, and he takes over Tandro's breathing. This gives Tandro an extra layer of focus as he does not have to focus on breathing and fighting, he simply has to focus on fighting. Think of this being similar to the primary Lotus from Naruto, allowing Tandro to get 100% focus in the brain. When using this form, Tandro's total breathing and concentration is pushed to its absolute limit. You could say it's like a hyper form in a way, and in this form, using this in conjunction with any of the other sword techniques, whether they be in the water breathing or in the venom breathing, it doubles the amount of damage that Tandro can do. However, the drawback is that this technique can only be used for a maximum time limit of 3 minutes at a time, and once it's over, Tandro's body goes into a temporary state of shock where he is unable to move as his body must calm down from using the frenzy form. Venom would basically have to use Tandro's body like it's on autopilot, however in doing so, this would only put him at 50% of his true strength. This would be the drawback until Tandro's body eventually calms down and he can restore himself to regular breathing. Basically, imagine if Tandro took in a deep breath, held all the air into his lungs, and then with Venom, Venom would keep the air in his lungs in place long enough for him to go into a hyper state of power. This is why it is known as the double critical. While it doubles the amount of damage and power that Tandro can do, it also deals a critical blow to Tandro and to a lesser extent Venom in the long run. On top of mastering the 10 water breathing forms, he would also learn in the Venom breathing at night, giving him little time to rest as he would be training non-stop. Eventually the time would come when Sankoji would reveal that he had taught Tanjiro everything that he could possibly teach him, and that for his final test he was to slice a boulder in half. If he could do so, then Sankoji would allow him to compete in the final selection, to join in the Demon Slayer core. And just like before, he would not be able to use Venom for help. During this time, Nezuko would fall into a deep sleep and would not be able to wake up. It would be around 6 months or so that would pass, as Tandra would continue in his training attempting to slice through the rock, however he would make no progress at all. As he would begin to give up, a young man in a fox mask named Sabito would appear before him, as well as a young girl named Makomo in a fox mask. Sabato would scold Tanjiro for not focusing on his breathing techniques. As he would hold out a wooden sword, he would challenge Tanjiro to a battle, and Tanjiro would be worried as he was using a real one. However, Sabato would remark that Tanjiro were not strong enough to pose a threat, so that the wooden sword would be more than sufficient. From time to time, Sabato would return and challenge Tanjiro, with Tanjiro losing every time. Whenever he wasn't fighting with Sabato or attempting to slice through the boulder, he would have conversations with Makamo, who would explain that they too were students under Senkoji, and that they had been taken in as orphans. Eventually, the time would come as Tanjiro would grow stronger and stronger in his training until eventually Sabato would reveal he had a real sword, explaining that this was going to be the final time. Tandro would finally be able to reach Sabato, slicing through his defenses and cutting his mask off, as Sabato would congratulate Tandro on a job well done. Tandro's vision would restore itself, revealing that he had not sliced through the mask, 
but that he had actually managed to slice through the boulder itself. Overjoyed, he would look to find where the siblings had gone, but they would have vanished. Tanjiro now seeing that his sword was now able to cut through the boulder, he realized that he was ready for the final selection. As he would prepare himself to leave, Sankoji would give Tanjiro a fox mask that contained a special spell inside of it for protection, as he would take the Nichirin sword that he had been given to use for the final selection. Sankoji would remark that he would watch after Nezuko, who still had not awoken at this time. As he would leave and make way, Tanjiro would tell him to say hello to Sabato and Makimo for him, startling Urukadokai, who would wonder how he had known the names of dead children. Not too long after, Tanjiro would arrive to Mount Fukushi Sana. Tanjiro would see that there were wistira blooming all around at the base of the mountain, and that there were a number of other teenagers that had arrived. The group would be greeted by a pair of girls, who would tell them of the many demons who would be imprisoned on the mountain. However, they were unable to leave, as the wisterias were what blocked them, as they hated the flower, as it served as a barrier, and they bloomed all year long at the base keeping them trapped there. From that point on, where the wisteria did not grow, the combatants would be told to survive for seven days, and that if they did so, they would be able to pass. As the final selection would begin, Tandro would make his way of the wisteria barrier, where they would not receive protection. While inside, Tandro would come face to face with two stray demons. He would attempt to get information from them, however they would not be there to speak, as they would merely lunge and attempt to kill him. Tandro would enter into his venom only form, increasing his strength, speed, and reflexes, as he would perform the wire breathing, 8th form, waterfall basin, slicing through the two demons effortlessly, remarking that they could see the growth in their power as now what seemed to be difficult with a single swing proved to be almost effortless. As Tandro would continue and make his way through the mountain area, remarking that he would in all likelihood need to rest during the day so that he could fight at night, he would hear the yells of one of the other participants as a large demon would be preparing to kill him. Tandro would swing in and grab the participant out of the way, telling him to run. As he went back to face the demon, the demon would appear to be monstrous in size, his body covered in multiple hands. He would be unable to smell Tanjiro, but he could see him clear as day. However, what he could see was the yokai mask that he had been given. The demon would ask Tanjiro what year he was in, Tanjiro revealing the date. The demon would begin to curse as he realized that he was now trapped and that more time in decades had passed. This would confuse Tandro a bit, until eventually the demon would reveal that he had been trapped on that mountain long ago by Uric Kodokai himself, and that as his form of revenge, he would target all of his students as they were known for wearing those masks, remarking that Tandro would be the 14th one that he had killed. This would start to anger Tandro a bit, as he began to think to himself about Sabito and Makamo, wondering if they were real in the first place. He would speak to Venom and ask him if he remembered them at all, and Venom would explain that the whole time Tandro had just been slicing at the boulder, and that he had only been talking to himself. As this dark and grim realization started to settle in, the demon would continue to antagonize Tanjiro, remarking over and over again how he enjoyed killing them, making fun of their death. Tanjiro had finally heard enough. Now in his venom only form, Tanjiro would begin to attack at the demon, using his venom breathing style, fourth form, frenzy strike, 
He would attack and slice from every direction. However, the demon would remark that his skin and hide had become as hard as steel. From years of eating away at other humans and growing in his power, there was no weak spot and it would be impossible for him to be struck down. However, Tondro wouldn't listen as he continued in his fury. However, he would then hear the voices of Sabato, remembering to keep his calm and to always focus on his breathing. With a deep breath, Tondro would continue the frenzy form until eventually, while twirling in midair, he would see it. He would see the thread, the thread that focused itself all the way to the weak point. With a large strike, Tondro would bellow forward as he would yell out, water breathing, first form, water surface slash. And strengthened by the power of venom, Tondro would then effortlessly slice through the demon's hard steel-like neck until eventually his nitrine sword would fall through and the demon would be cut down. As Tondro would turn back, now reverting back to his human form, he would see the demon as it began to bellow and cry, falling down to its knees in anguish. This, however, would have a profound effect on Tondro and his mental state. Venom remarking that he had gotten what he deserved for being a loudmouth, and Tondro not disapproving in that statement as he had given in to his own anger and his hatred. However, now a new feeling had been turned into that form, a feeling of sadness and regret. As in the demon's final moments, it did not cry out in anger, but rather it remembered its life before it had become a demon, when it was just a young boy, remembering that even after his transformation, he had always longed for the warm hold, specifically of that of his older brothers, who he had lost in death years ago. Tandra would continue to survive throughout the rest of the final selection, asking any demons who he could if there were any way to turn Nezuko back into a human, although none would answer him. Eventually, the final selection would come to an end. Tandro, along with three others, would have returned back to the area of the Wisterias, and the two twins would greet them as being the only survivors. The twins would tell them that there were ten ranks in the Demon Slayer course, and that the four of them would now be Mizunoto, the lowest rank. However, among the four of them, there would be one in particular who would be impatient, a boy with a mohawk and scars, who would only ask when they would be getting their swords. The twins would try to explain the other aspects of the Demon Slayer core, talking about the Kasugi crows, that would be used as their way of communication, along with getting their measurements for their uniforms. However, the applicant would continue to angrily demand for his swords, Tandro becoming more annoyed by the second, as well as Venom who couldn't stand his pestering whining, as the boy would reach out and grab one of the twins roughly by the collar. Tandro would reach out his arm towards the young man, telling him to let them go. As the young Mohawk boy would ask what he was going to do about it, he would remark that he would break his arm. The haughty swordsman would not relent, and then effortlessly with a snap, Tandro would snap away his arm. He could feel as if it had been fractured as he would pull away. Tandro had not even used his venom power in order to do so, this showing the true resolve of his strength and that it didn't just come from venom alone. Eventually after receiving his crow and his measurements being taken, he would eventually make his way back to Mount Seguri. As Ur Kodokai would be waiting, he would see him in the distance and run to him happily as well as Nezuko who would appear after a year and a half long slumber. 
all three would embrace one another in a hug, happy to be reunited. And in doing so, a feast would be prepared immediately. Much to Venom's pleasure, among many of the foods and delicacy, there was an assortment of roast and sesame duck. Duck cooked in every way and form and delight, Venom taking special pleasure in clearing all of the duck until there was nothing left at all. While waiting for his sword to arrive along with his uniform, Tondro would speak to his master about what happened on the mountain, referring to the demon he had slain and how he had avenged the many of his students who had fallen over the years. As they did so, within time, Tondro's new sword would be delivered to him by the swordsman known as Hagana Zuko. The swordsman being particularly proud of his swords and ready to see what color Tondro's would become. The Nitrine swords were made from a special steel that was found only in the mountains, a mountain that was always basked in sunlight, sunlight being the enemy to all demons. As Tondro pulled out his sword, they would be surprised as it changed not into the color they were expecting, but it would change into a color that was completely black. This would shock them as this color was rather rare, and in all the same, the omen of this sword could never be interpreted, as it could either be good or it could be bad. Not too long after receiving his sword, the Kusagi Crow would arrive, telling Tandro of his first assignment as a demon hunter to go to a town that was north-northwest where young girls were vanishing left and right and it was believed that there was a demon who would be responsible. As Tandro would don his demon slayer uniform, he would soon be given something else by his master before leaving. His master would give him a special kimono that had been made. However, it wasn't like the one that he had worn before, as it didn't have the green and the black square pattern. However, this robe was completely all black, and on its back, there was nothing but a spider. The pattern behind the spider would reach out as white-like webs would don the robe. Tandra would ask what was the meaning of it, and he would explain that he saw the way Tandra moved in the air as he trained and fought, referring to him dancing like a spider, like a spider that was dancing in the rain. As such, it served as the inspiration for the robe that he had been given, and Tandra was thankful to his sensei. He would also be given a specially made wooden box, made essentially to keep all of the light out so that Nezuko could shrink down and stay inside during the day and also he could carry it on his back and if Venom were willing he could encase it with symbiote to keep it extra protected. Venom would agree to this and soon after Nezuko would get inside as they would begin their journey and make their way to the town north northwest. The new adventure had now begun for them Tandro, unsure of what the future held, now with a new power within him, a power that might give humanity its hope that it needed, not just in saving the ones that he loved, but in also defeating the demons. For now, the new dawn had begun, and all who cowered in anger and fear all demons who enacted their own sense of evil in the world would be met by Tondro and his dark fury. This concludes What If Tondro Had Venom, Demon Slayer, Dark Fury, Part 1. As always, for all this and more, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcasting that is to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned for Thursday's episode of 
What if Spider-Man was in ReZero? The Princess and the Spider, Season 2, Part 1. But with that, we're going to conclude today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.